So, um, a couple decades ago, I was in college and um, went on a mission trip to Honduras. Um, we spent several months preparing for the mission trip. We learned about the history and the culture of Honduras. We prayed for the community where we were going to be staying. And we uh, raised money for the trip, money to support us as we were there, to provide for food and pay for shelter and all of those things. Chinkin is the community where we were going to be, and they were also preparing for our visit. We were going to go uh, build a church. That's what the community had discerned that they needed. And so in order to build the church, bricks had to be made. And so each family in the community promised to make so many bricks for the church. These bricks are made out of mud and straw. And then they have to bake in the sun for a month in order for them to be ready for building. What I lift up here is that there was a deep investment both by the Honduran community and by the Duke community in preparing for this time together. When we arrived in country, we heard a story of the previous team who had come the previous year to a different community and built a community center. And apparently, the wall, one of the walls of the community center fell down. So we, being competitive Duke students, <laughs> said, we are not going to have our walls fall down. We are not going to do that. And so <coughs> we paid close attention when we arrived in Chinkin and listened to the instructions of our site leader, Don Juan. And so he instructed us that we would carefully lay a level of bricks on the foundation that we had dug. And then Don Juan would come and pull out a plumb line and measure each corner to make sure that each corner was plumb all the way around. And once we had adjusted all of that, then came my job, which was to sling uh, mud, which is what we would use for the mortar. And so you'd sling the mud up on top of the bricks and in between each brick to help uh, make a really strong wall. And then the process would begin again, and we'd go and we'd start laying the next level of bricks all the way around, and then the plumb line came out, and we all would take a good pause when that plumb line came out. We understood how vital it was to make sure that the walls were plumb for the structural integrity of the building. It was a chance for us to evaluate what we were raising if our labor and investment was true on its foundation. If the wall was not plumb, then we knew that the entire structure was at risk of falling down. So this image of a plumb line that Amos offers is useful language for our spiritual and earthly labor. The gospel passage today is so well known. We all probably are ready to tune out. We know what the message is. There are even some laws that are named after this parable, Good Samaritan laws, which protect those who act on behalf of someone who is suffering. Let's set aside that title for a moment, the title that says this is the parable of the Good Samaritan. There is nowhere in our text that that name is offered up. 
Our gospel passage today includes a lawyer who was not in favor of Jesus. In fact, scripture says he stood up to test Jesus. And with that word test, we should hear that this lawyer had an agenda. He asked Jesus what he must do to inherit eternal life. And Jesus answers his question with a question, as Jesus frequently does. What does the law say? It's a great way to understand where a person is approaching the conversation from, asking a follow-up question. The lawyer cites Leviticus and Deuteronomy, love the Lord your God with all your heart, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus responds to him, exactly right. And the lawyer persists and asks, given these laws, who is my neighbor? This sounds like a trap. And yet the very section of the law that the lawyer cites, Leviticus 19, verse 18, which says, You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Goes on to say, in verse 33, when an alien resides with you in your land, you shall not oppress the alien. The alien who resides with you shall be to you as the native born among you. You shall love the alien as yourself, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Jesus understands that this lawyer's question is not really about who is my neighbor. The law has already made that very clear. Jesus flips the question from who is my neighbor to how am I a neighbor? Let's return to Honduras. As the walls grew higher and higher, plumb and strong and tall, the need for scaffolding arose, which the scaffolding was compiled of two tender trees strapped horizontally by vines to two tall posts. I was on mortar duty again, and there was an accident one day where I fell from the scaffolding up high onto the rocky ground below, and my legs went numb. And I ended up spending the next few days lying in a hammock on the front porch of the two-room house where I was staying. I could not walk, and I relied on the assistance of my teammates to perform basic everyday functions. There was a woman there whom I will call Maria. She came to the house every day with a whole team of women to prepare and cook the meals for the team of laborers, both from North America and from Chinkin. She had five children of her own and was a widow. Her husband had died of AIDS. She said to me the evening after my fall, as I lay in a hammock, with my friend translating her words to me. She said, Isabel, that's my name in Spanish. I don't have much to offer. I'm a mother to five children with no husband, but I see you hurting. You are welcome to stay with me and my family for as long as it takes for you to heal. I will take care of you as my own. Her husband died of AIDS because he had contracted HIV from a prostitute when he went to the city. This woman didn't eat many days because she knew her children needed the little food they had for their own growth and development. And yet, this beloved of God who fought each day for the health and well-being of her family, opened her home to me, this gringa, 
because she saw me and she had compassion and she responded in the way that she understood her faith and her community called her to respond. She was bold, courageous, love. She was neighbor. It is a great responsibility to be a neighbor. There are so many points of privilege that I recognize in this story. The leaders wanted to call an evacuation helicopter, and I declined because I wanted to be with the community and my team. This meant that the community had to cut a fresh bamboo tree and string a hammock to it and hike me up and over the mountain to where our overland vehicle would meet us. And yet, God was very present in the people around me, in Maria, who offered to take me in as her own. I am now a solo parent, and I know more fully what a sacrifice of love that is. The love of my teammates, who bore my weight when I could not hold it upright myself. My dear friend who journeyed to the hospital with me, translating the medics and doctors and family, and a family who took me in for the night so that I could be evaluated at the hospital, and so that we could borrow a set of crutches, and so that we could procure some pain medicine. My friend who gently washed with a pitcher and a tub all the caked on mud that attached to my hair when I fell into our beautiful building. And after the x-rays were taken and after the crutches were borrowed from friends, I was serenaded awake the next morning to a song on the accordion, a special birthday song of the family hosting me, and I felt the love of God around me. I share all of this because these were my neighbors. These were the people who taught me what this parable is about. These are the ones who loved me as themselves, who saw the suffering of another and respected and honored the dignity of this human being. They offered love, community, family, in a time of great pain and fear. The Samaritan was not good. The Samaritan embodied being a neighbor. The Samaritan responded to honoring the dignity of the human being before him honoring the belovedness of the person in front of him, that beloved person created in the image of God. The Samaritan in Jesus' parable saw the suffering, and his faith compelled him to respond with compassion and recognize the dignity of God's beloved child. And so he bandaged the wounds those gaping places where pain is immediately evident and where infection of the body and soul can so quickly set in. And in those moments, in those intimate spaces of vulnerability and humanity, that person sought to heal another with oil of healing and words of community and compassion and love. And then he provided for his wounded neighbor, recognizing that it takes time to heal from the wounds that our community inflicts on those who are vulnerable, afflicted, and outside of our experience. This is how Jesus responds to the lawyer in his questions about eternal life. Jesus intuits that this lawyer, like many of us, intellectually knows what it means to be a neighbor 
and how much that responsibility is required to be faithful and respond with love. So Jesus asks him, how? How are you a neighbor? How are you showing up as neighbor? The who of neighbor is not important. That has already been addressed in the law. Jesus calls us into the responsibility of embodiment of loving neighbor, of being love. Jesus lives this throughout his ministry, seeing the children of God and responding with healing love. Seeing and responding as neighbor brings us into kairos, into God's time, a time of sanctuary to heal. As neighbor experiences healing, as that takes hold, then the remembrance of one's worth as a child of God resurfaces. How are you neighbor? We are called to be neighbor in how we vote, or in the simple act of holding a hand, or in breaking bread with another. Love God. Be sure that your foundation is firm, that your building is plumb in God's love, and then love your neighbor. That is the core of our humanity, grounding in the love of our Creator and reaching out to one another with mercy and abiding love. Who was the neighbor, Jesus asked? The one who showed mercy. Go and do likewise, again and again and again. Amen.